left government service in 2003 um, and I didn't immediately resume an academic career. I went to help set up um, uh, an NGO in Canberra that was multi-sectoral. And um, uh, this was the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth led by Fiona Stanley. And this opened my eyes to a significant extent to this sense in which uh, the government sector, the research sector, and the NGO sector uh, were different, but needed to work together much better to cope with um, exploring and, and improving the major um, social and health issues of the day. And uh, working with those people over three years uh, taught me a lot about um, the incredible depth of knowledge and understanding that was available through the NGO sector that was not really well understood either in the research sector or in many parts of government. So I then formulated my notion that uh, for policy, we need to take seriously and respectfully uh, a broader uh, view of what is valuable evidence. Um, the, the narrow kind of notion of evidence-based policy as privileging uh, research-based, particularly quantitative evidence, uh, seemed to be incapable of really getting very far in helping with the kinds of issues that we were trying to grapple with. So um, I started writing some things personally to just say, uh, let's get serious about uh, uh, evidence pluralism, if you like. And those sort of ideas I've been testing out in various forums for um, a long time since. I, I just mentioned in passing that um, I was at an international conference on Monday and they were all talking about the way in which everyone was moving away from uh, a narrow focus on, uh, if you like, scientific, rigorous, uh, uh, verifiable, experimental evidence as the epitome of good, of good knowledge. And that um, uh, this would be done perhaps in two main ways, which is to get to your point, Peter, that I think um, on the, on the one hand, finding ways to communicate directly with people who are affected by programs or who are trying to develop uh, new ways of thinking about uh, a whole range of issues, whether it's in disability services, whether it's in uh, Indigenous self-determination, whatever the field, we absolutely have to find ways to um, enable uh, voice as directly as possible in the process. The other thing that my students ask me a lot is, uh, are there any process or procedural tools that can help us tap into these forms of evidence? And uh, I'm quite partial to well-run public inquiries, which call for submissions on key issues. I know that a lot of people uh, find that a bit cumbersome and laborious, but I think we've shown in, in a number of recent examples that uh, these provide a great platform for a very wide range of stakeholders to be engaged directly or indirectly through advocacy groups to state points of view which are otherwise um, unexplored. The meaningfulness, the veracity, the representativeness of oral evidence is something that we test out in quite practical ways in different forums. Um, you know, the so-called pub test, uh, but also courts of law, uh, royal commissions, uh, various kinds of public inquiries which are trying to weave together um, uh, the, the different narratives and different interests coming from uh, various quarters. One of the, one of the great things that um, APO has been doing is, is curating a lot of documents that uh, in very diverse ways bring together a lot of that material in a way that is um, intelligible and well communicated and no doubt very influential. As you said before, Peter, um, you know, having having open sources of information is the best way to make sure that uh, interests are protected and that people have a good understanding of each other's point of view, without which we tend to just ride roughshod over, uh, over the powerless.